Hello everyone, and uh, thank you for uh, uh, tuning in for the God and Government Conference. My name is Jeremy Collins, and uh, before anything else, I want to open up with a brief word of prayer. God, thank you for today. Thank you for the love you have shown us, and thank you for how you have blessed us. Uh, thank you for the privilege to be part of this conference. Help me to teach accurately so that I am uh, honoring you with what is being taught and am equipping the saints to fight against destructive ideologies that set themselves against your truth. In your name we pray. Amen. Uh, I want to start off first by saying what an honor and a privilege it is to be part of this conference that has such huge names as some of the other speakers. Uh, for example, George Grant, one of the other speakers, his 25th anniversary of the book Killer Angel the 25th anniversary edition just came out not too long ago, and I am not even 25 yet, so that means that that book has been out longer than I've been alive. Uh, it's quite intimidating to be speaking with such more respected people than me that no one knows who my name is, but that's all right. It's good to have a bit of an intimidation factor going into a conference sometimes. So the topic that Brandon assigned to me for this conference is critical theory to talk about God, government, and critical theory, which is the title of my talk. Uh, so he didn't really give me a lot of specifics. I said, you want me to talk about specific aspects of critical theory? He said, whatever you feel comfortable with. So I'm going to talk a little bit about critical theory specifically, or like critical theory in general, and then critical race theory specifically. Uh, the reason I'm going to be talking about critical race theory specifically and not other things like queer theory or disability studies or uh, fat studies or post-colonial theory or some of the other forms of critical theory is because I am a Christian in the United States of America and uh, critical race theory is right now the most dangerous form of critical theory that is in the United States of America. If I was a Christian in the United Kingdom, fat studies, which basically think critical fat theory, but they call it fat studies instead. Fat studies might be more important if I was a believer in the United Kingdom because it's more prominent there than it is in the U.S. But it's not as prominent in the U.S. and I live in the U.S. so I'm focusing right now on critical race theory. Uh, also, as far as I know, no big evangelical institution in the United States has declared queer theory to be a helpful analytical tool. At least, the last time I checked, the guys from Revoice hadn't said that yet. Maybe now they have. Who knows? But in 2019, the SBC did say critical race theory is an analytical tool that can be helpful as long as it is kept subservient to Scripture. So that is why I am focusing on critical race theory in this talk. So getting into it, first let's look at the term critical theory. What does critical theory mean? Uh, defining terms is important, so let me give you a definition of this term that comes from the book Cynical Theories by James Lindsay and Helen Pluckrose. Uh, you are going to be familiar with this book by the end of this talk because this is not even close to the last time I will be quoting from this book. So in that book, they define it this way in their introduction. A critical theory is chiefly concerned with revealing hidden biases and under-examined assumptions, usually by pointing out what have been termed problematics, which are ways in which the society and the systems that it operates upon are going wrong. So now that we have a basic idea of what a critical theory is, let's try to get an understanding and a background of it. Uh, this honestly may have been the most difficult part of this session to write. There's so many different ways I can go, and it just seems like no matter which one I choose, it feels inadequate in some way. I could go deep into the history of critical theory and how it developed or prominent people that came up with different ideas that snowballed and led up to critical theory. Or I could ignore boring you with a bunch of dates and names and talk about the uh, more philosophical foundations of critical theory. And I think that last option is the best one. So uh, the main ideas behind critical theory that helped it develop and become what we know it as today are postmodernism and Marxism. Now you might be thinking, postmodernism and Marxism, they're two different things. They're 
not the same, they're different. So how can critical theory have roots and foundations in both of them? Well, to once again quote from cynical theories, I think that Lindsay and Pluckrose give a helpful understanding of this in this quote. The line of thought which grants double sight to the oppressed but not to the oppressor is often attributed to Marxism, but it's more accurate to say that postmodernism and Marxism share a common philosophical ancestor in the works of German philosopher George Wilhelm Friedrich, Friedrich Hegel, though Marx may have been a significant conduit of these ideas for postmodernists. As always, postmodernism and Marxism exhibit significant and intentional differences. The key difference is whether the oppressed suffer from false consciousness as a result of a hidden imposition of power, as the Marxists believed, or whether it is the oppressors who suffer from the false consciousness due to their socialization into a system of knowledge that benefits them, as the postmodernists would increasingly have it. So from that quote, we see how postmodernism and Marxism have both impacted the oppressor versus oppressed narratives that are at the core of all the various forms of critical theory. So let's talk a bit about a bit more about this oppressor versus oppressed narrative as it relates to critical theory and as it is foundational to critical theory. It's easy to see oppressor versus oppressed narratives when we look at some of the things from a century ago like uh, the Bolshevik Revolution and Leninism and all that other stuff from a century ago. It's easy to see the oppressor versus oppressed when we look at those economic ones. It was the poor people versus the rich people. The rich people are somehow oppressing the poor people by being rich because they have this idea that the pie is only so big. So if you have a bigger slice, someone else has to have a smaller one. They just forget the fact that the rich actually make the pie bigger, not take more of it. Um, but you saw all of that a century ago with the economic oppressor versus oppressed. And actually a negative consequence of that for the middle class was that the super rich are super rich for a reason. They know how to avoid some of the negative consequences that come from various things. They know how to avoid risk. So a lot of the super rich saw things like the Bolshevik Revolution coming and were able to put themselves in a position to either escape it or at least minimize the negative consequences for themselves. So a lot of times the middle class or upper middle class was the one hurt the most while the super rich were almost unscathed by some of these types of revolutions something pretty common in the more poor versus rich economic revolutions, which is something to keep in note for America's future. But these economic oppressor versus oppressed narratives are not the only time we see oppressor versus oppressed narratives. We also see it in many other ways with the various forms of critical theory today. Uh, we see it in ethnicity. You see white versus black. That's an oppressor versus oppressed narrative where the oppressor class is known as white supremacy. You see it in white versus Hispanic, and in this case, the oppressor class is also called white supremacy. You see it in white versus Asian, once again, white supremacy, and you see it in white versus pretty much everyone else, and once again, white supremacy. Basically, white supremacy is just the devil incarnate, and that's kind of how ethnic forms of critical theory, like critical race theory, work. But you see it in other ways. You see it in a more feminist version of critical theory where it's men versus women and that men are the oppressors. And in this instance, they call it the patriarchy. You see it in a heterosexual or straight versus LGBTQ plus oppressor versus oppressed narratives where the uh, term for the oppressors is called heteronormativity, which means normalizing heterosexuality. Not that we're normalizing heterosexuality because God already normalized heterosexuality when he wrote Genesis 1 and 2, but you know, that's besides the point. Uh, then we also see it in the cisgender versus transgender. Uh, cisgender is basically just meaning you're a guy who's not insane and knows you're a guy, or you're a girl who's not insane and knows you're a girl. That's basically what cisgender means. Cisgender versus transgenderism. And that one, the oppressive cisgender people, that's called cisnormativity, where being cisgendered is the normal thing. That's what cisnormativity means. Now, a few minutes ago, I um, was talking about postmodernism and all of that, so I want to go back to that for a minute now that I've given you a bit more about oppressor versus oppressed. 
Uh, Postmodernism, I think, is in full swing in America today. Now, some people may object to that. They may say, Jeremy, you're wrong. Postmodernism died out back in the 80s and 90s, and we don't really see any postmodernism today. Well, uh, the answer to that is not a simple yes or it's not a simple no. Yes, traditional postmodernism died out in the 80s or 90s, but what we see today is a new form of postmodernism. James Lindsay calls this one applied postmodernism. So I want to talk a little bit about postmodernism versus applied postmodernism, but before I do that, I want to help you understand what postmodernism is by giving you a foundation of pre-modernism, modernism, and postmodernism. So uh, to give a quick, brief bit of an oversimplification of these terms, pre-modernism is before the Enlightenment, and it basically means some sort of higher authority tells us what is true, whether that be the God of Scripture, or Allah, or even the idea of the world of ideas or realm of ideas from Plato. Something like that tells us what is true. That was pre-modernism. Then you get modernism. So pre-modernism was a little bit more dualistic. Modernism is not dualistic. Modernism is more or less just materialism. We get our truth from the scientific method, from our laws of logic, and from that alone. We don't get it from a god or some sort of force or any sort of higher power or anything like that. So modernism kind of lasted from the Enlightenment to like the middle of the 20th century. And then we get to postmodernism, which started in the middle of the 20th century, lasted to about the 80s or 90s, and then applied postmodernism from about the 80s or 90s till now. Or you can just look at both under the overarching term postmodernism from the middle of the 20th century to now. Um, so that's a bit of a simplified way to understand those three, but let me give you an even more simplified one to help you remember it. Pre-modernism, some sort of higher power or force determines truth. Modernism, scientific method determines truth. Postmodernism, there is no truth. Applied postmodernism, uh, truth comes from human experiences, specifically oppressed human experiences. Uh, so before I go into explaining the differences between postmodernism and applied postmodernism, uh, let me first explain the similarities. So uh, postmodernism and applied postmodernism hold to six things that are considered by many to be the core tenets of postmodernism. James Lindsay and Helen Pluckrose describe them. They say there is the postmodern knowledge principle which is radical skepticism about whether objective knowledge or truth is obtainable and a commitment to cultural constructivism. The postmodern political principle is next. So first the knowledge principle, now the political principle. The political principle says, a belief that society is formed of systems of power and hierarchies which decide what can be known and how. And then the other four of the six are the four themes of postmodernism. One, the blurring of boundaries. Two, the power of language. Three, cultural relativism. And four, the loss of the individual and the universal. Those are the six core tenets of postmodernism, and they help us see how postmodernism and applied postmodernism are both forms of postmodernism. So um, one more brief overview that I forgot to mention a minute ago to help you try to remember the differences between modernism, pre-modernism, and postmodernism. Uh, this is how Todd Friel uses baseball to help us remember the difference. Todd Friel, in his book, Judge, no, sorry, not in his book, Judge Not, in his book, Jesus Unmasked, he says that in uh, pre-modernism, the ump calls them as they are. In pre-modernism, the ump calls them as they are. In modernism, the ump calls them as he sees them. And then with postmodernism, the ump calls them and that's what they are. So that's how Todd Frio uses balls and strikes in baseball to help you understand the difference between modernism, postmodernism, and premodernism. So what is the difference between postmodernism and applied postmodernism? I know I might be boring you a bit now, but this is a really important foundation that I will build upon when we get more into critical theory and critical race theory. So I hinted at it a bit ago when I was explaining the different ones. Postmodernism wants to tear down all meta-narratives, meta whether from a higher power, which would be pre-modernism, or a materialistic meta-narrative, which would be modernism, 
whatever that meta narrative is, postmodernism wants to tear it down. So, what exactly is a meta narrative? It is an overarching idea of how to view the world, how to view history, and what the goal of the world is, what the telos of the world is. So, think of a meta narrative pretty similar to a worldview. Postmodernism wants to tear down all of these meta narratives about how we understand the world and history and the telos of the universe. But applied postmodernism realizes how terrible of an idea it is to destroy all meta narratives because you need some overarching way to make sure you understand this world. So, postmodernism, they want to deconstruct the current meta narratives to replace them with new ones, which are based upon power struggles and oppressed versus oppressor narratives and things like that. Um, so, that whole oppressor narrative with postmodernism is uh, how we get to the idea of standpoint theory, but I'm not going to go into standpoint theory yet. That's going to come a little bit later. So, that is the postmodernism and the Marxist, actually both at the same time, foundations of critical theory. And then, uh, now let's look a bit more at what critical theory actually is. I gave that definition from Lindsay and Pluck Rose a minute ago to uh, help you get a bit of a foundation of what critical theory is. So now let's look back at that definition and instead of just reading it this time, I'm going to read it and then go into it a little bit to explain it. So their definition was, a critical theory is chiefly concerned with revealing hidden biases and under-examined assumptions, usually by pointing out what have been termed problematics which are ways in which the society and the systems that it operates upon are going wrong. So that's how we get our basic idea of critical theory, but let's flesh that out a bit more. So let's look at the first part of the definition. A critical theory is chiefly concerned with revealing hidden biases and under-examined assumptions. So if you've ever wondered about this new idea that all white people are racist, all white people have inherent racism, you can never repent enough of your racism because until the day you are glorified, you will still have inherent racism to fight against. Uh, that is where this idea comes from. You know, if you know about that, you know a little bit about this idea of revealing hidden biases and under-examined assumptions. This is the idea those who want to posit themselves at the top of society to give themselves power and privilege, they have spent centuries ingraining into the culture certain things that help them to develop power for themselves, to grow in their prestige and power and influence and privilege, and then once they have it, to maintain it. So the idea is that these hidden biases and underexamined assumptions are just ingrained into the core of our culture over the centuries by people trying to posit themselves as the top ruling class to gain power for themselves. Uh, and then they say that whether or not you know about these assumptions, you benefit from them if you are part of the, that ruling class type thing, whether you know it or not, because it's at the core of society. So the idea is that this oppressing class are white, cisgender, heterosexual males that white cisgender heterosexual males have spent who knows how many centuries trying to define the other in terms of themselves to give themselves power and prestige. They try to make themselves the norm and everything else considered abnormal. Uh, and to take that one step at a time to explain it, the idea is cisgender is to be normative and the standard by which everything else is understood. Transgenderism is only considered wrong because cisgender, cisgendered oppressors made themselves the standard and caused everything else to be understood to be wrong. To be cisgender is to be normal and everything else is to be abnormal. Heterosexuality is normative and the standard by which everything else is understood. Homosexuality and bisexuality, and we might as well add polygamy or man-boy love or whatever other euphemism they try to use to make, um, to make pedophilia sound all right and normalize it. Those things are all considered wrong because heterosexual oppressors made themselves the standard and caused everything else to be considered to be wrong. To be heterosexual is to be normal and anything else is abnormal. Whiteness is normal and the standard by which everything else is understood. 
blackness or Hispanicness or Asianness or Native Indianness or any other kind of ethnicity with ness at the end are considered wrong because white oppressors made themselves the standard, so any other ethnicity needs to be understood in terms of white first. To be white is to be normal, and anything else is abnormal. Then maleness is normative and the standard by which everything else is to be understood. Femaleness is only considered wrong because male oppressors made themselves the standard and caused everything else to be considered to be wrong. To be a male is to be normal, and to be anything else is abnormal. Read patriarchy. Now, two of those four ideas that I just gave there actually aren't that far off. God made humans from the beginning as male and female. They are to leave their father and mother and cleave to each other. That marriage is to one person of the opposite sex, and no one else can change his sex that was assigned to him at conception, which is when life began. So it isn't wrong to say that heterosexuality and cisgender are the standards by which all other things are to be understood because God created heterosexuality and cisgenderedness as the way the world is. It is built into the created order by God and anything else are aberrations and rebellions against God. But whiteness and maleness are not standards from which everything else is to be understood. Like I said a moment ago, God made humans from the beginning as male and female. It's not that God only made men at the beginning and then at some point along the way, men created women on their own as a rebellion against God like they did with homosexuality or transgenderism. But God created them from the beginning, male and female. So it's not like femaleness is going against God's created order like homosexuality is. And then whiteness is not a standard from which all other ethnicities and skin tones are to be understood. As Paul said in Acts 17, that God made from one man every nation of mankind to inhabit all the face of the earth. So Noah and his wife, as well as Adam and Eve, were probably some sort of middle brown, which is why we get all the shades of melanin we have today from their descendants. So... We do not understand blackness in light of whiteness or femaleness in light of maleness, but critical theory wants us to think that way so that it can continue to posit the oppressor versus oppressed meta-narrative that they are using to replace the old meta-narratives that they are trying to deconstruct. So then the rest of the definition from Lindsay and Pluck Rose is usually by positing usually by pointing out what have been termed problematics, which are the ways in which the society and the systems that it operates upon are going wrong. So these hidden biases and underexamined assumptions are revealed by pointing out their quote-unquote problematics. So what exactly is a problematic? A problematic is the way in which society and the systems that it operates upon are going wrong, to borrow from the rest of their definition. So basically, that list of things I gave a minute ago about this oppressor, you know, cisgender, heterosexuality, heteronormativity, maleness, whiteness, all of that, those things are the problematics that need to be deconstructed, that need to be pointed out because of their hidden biases and underexamined assumptions, according to critical theory. So to give a couple examples of problematics, again, uh, the Bible says that men are to lead their households and they are to have authority and their wives are to submit to them. Not every woman submitting to every man, but each wife submitting to her own husband. This is not egalitarian, so it is a problematic and it needs to be de deconstructed so the new meta narrative of applied postmodernism can take its place. The Bible says that sodomy is evil and is worthy of capital punishment. It tells us that marriage is a picture of the gospel, that Christ and his church, his bride, the church, represent the husband and his bride, his wife. So homosexuality destroys that image of the gospel within every marriage. But this is not tolerant of LGBTQ+, so it is a problematic and this narrative needs to be deconstructed so that the new meta-narrative of applied postmodernism can take its place.
So that is a brief overview of critical theory and its inherent need to deconstruct everything that came before it so that way it can replace those old meta narratives with its new meta narratives of power struggle and oppressor versus oppressed narratives. But how does critical theory in general work itself out into the various forms of critical theory we see today? Basically, whatever that third word is that comes in the middle of, you know, you have critical and then you have theory, or for you all looking at me, critical over here and theory over here, whatever word comes in the middle is what that oppressor versus oppressed narrative is about. Critical race theory has to do with power struggles between ethnicities, as well as oppressor versus oppressed scenarios between them. Queer theory has to do with power struggles between heterosexuals and the LGBTQ+, as well as the oppressor versus oppressed narratives between them. Postcolonial theory has to do with power struggles between the colonizers and the colonized, although it's a lot more complicated than that, as well as its oppressor and oppressed scenarios between them. Disability studies has to do with power struggles between able-bodied and those with disabilities, one or more disabilities, as well as oppressor versus oppressed narratives between them. Uh, actually, I have asthma, so I might get some brownie points with this one. Uh, then fat studies has to do with power struggles between the slim and the fit, the, or the slim and the obese, as well as oppressor versus oppressed scenarios between them. Uh, this one I do not get any brownie points with because I think my BMI says I'm almost underweight. <laughs> Uh, then finally, gender studies has to do with power struggles between men and women and all kinds of other things as it relates to gender, as well as oppressor versus oppressed scenarios between them. So now that we look, have looked at exactly at what postmodernism or applied postmodernism and critical theory are, let's go into why they are important for Christians in our discussions of the church and the state, or let's say our discussions of God and government to use the name of the title of this conference in this. Uh, you know, after all, if I did not talk about how critical theory applies to God and government, then this would be a poor title of this sermon called God, Government, and Critical Theory being preached for a God and Government conference. So let's first look at how these ideas are important as they relate to the church, to the people of God, and then look even more at how it applies to the government. But um, before we begin, allow me to take a momentary detour. Uh, in his book, A Theology of Biblical Counseling, Heath Lambert started the first sentence of his first chapter with this line, counseling is a theological discipline. Then he goes on to explain, the reason he said that is if he starts off with the very, he makes the very beginning of his book be the most controversial point in the entire book. It's all downhill from there. If someone gets past the first sentence, they can get through the entire book. While I am not at the very beginning of this sermon, I am still at the beginning of the discussion of critical race theory and the church. So let me borrow a little bit from Pastor Heath Lambert and say this. Critical theory of any form is at best, at best, a, position, a poison to the church and the government. At worst, it is a destructive heresy that will tear apart the bride of Christ as well as destroy any government institution along with that culture and society where it gains a strong foothold. Actually, uh, you know what? I'm, I'm going to change that a bit. I'm, I'm not going to say that that is the worst case scenario because that is the current scenario we are in in the United States of America. Critical theory is currently tearing apart the bride of Christ and destroying government and culture. And I'm pretty sure it can get a lot worse than, than it already is in America, so I don't think that is the worst case scenario. I think the worst case scenario is actually a lot worse than that. So with that being said, let's dive a bit more into what critical race theory is, and then we will talk about how critical race theory applies to the church, and then finally to the government. So critical race theory and its friend intersectionality they are closely related. Sometimes it's kind of hard to explain the one without also explaining the other. So I'm going to explain both of them. I'm going to explain CRT first, and then I'm going to explain intersectionality. Critical race theory, like I said before, is a form of critical theory that focuses on race, or to use the more biblical term, ethnicity, 
because there are no different races of people. God created the entire human race from just Adam and Eve. Um, and if you do want to make any different races of people, then there are just the spiritual races of those in Adam and those in Christ. There are no physical races because we are all the human race of various ethnicities. So critical race theory tries to divide people on these ethnicities. Um, now, before we dive any further into CRT, I want to take a momentary brief uh, detour to just read two short passages to you to just keep in the back of your mind while I am explaining what CRT is. We're going to go back to these passages in a bit. Right now, I just want them to sit in the back of your mind while you listen to what I'm saying about critical theory. The first is Exodus chapter 23, verses 2 and 3. I am reading this from the New American Standard 1995 because Exodus is not yet out in the Legacy Standard Bible. Otherwise, I'd be using that one. So here's what it says. You shall not follow the masses in doing evil, nor shall you testify in a dispute so as to turn aside after a multitude in order to pervert justice, nor shall you be partial to a poor man in his dispute. Then the second passage is Leviticus 19.15. This one is also coming from the NASB 95. It reads, You shall do no injustice and judgment, nor shall you be partial to the poor, nor defer to the great, but you are to judge your neighbor fairly. So keep those in the back of your mind as I now go back to CRT. Uh, CRT being short for critical race theory. CRT focuses on, like I said before, ethnicity. That is what this type of critical theory is. It says that white people are the oppressors and that non-white people, especially black people, are the oppressed. Basically, take the rich versus poor narrative from Leninism and the revolutions in, uh, over in Russia a century ago and basically just substitute in uh, the rich replaced with white and the poor replaced with black and you have what critical race theory is. So uh, the word, oh, here it is. So this is a definition of critical race theory that James Lindsay and Helen Pluck Rose give in their book. They say critical race theory formerly arose in the 1970s through the critical study of law as it pertains to issues of race. The word critical here means that it is that its intention and methods are specifically geared towards identifying and exposing problematics in order to facilitate revolutionary political change. So CRT holds that white people are racist whether they know it or not. White people have unconscious racism because American and or Western and or Anglo culture they grew up in. Even if you love black people and Hispanic people and Asian people and all kinds of people made in the image of God, if you are white in America, you have hidden racism that you probably aren't even aware of and you will never fully get rid of your hidden racism in your heart, according to CRT. Uh, and if you are thinking of certain people, especially from the SBC right now, then you're probably thinking correctly. Uh, they say that you just have to keep admitting your hidden racism and saying you are sorry for it. You just have to keep saying you're sorry over and over again until people of color finally tell you it's enough. And if you are wondering if that was a reference to Ligon Duncan's sermon from Together for the Gospel 2016, I'm sorry, 2018, then yes, it was intentionally a reference to Ligon Duncan's sermon from Together for the Gospel 2018. I was actually there in person and heard him say that line live. And it was something. So basically, white people are inherently racist. That is their hidden bias and their underexamined assumption, to go back to the definition of critical theory from the start. That is why books like Robin D'Angelo's White Fragility are so popular and so destructive. And in fact, D'Angelo's book is now criticized for being racist itself because it is so white. It is too white, and it gives white people a way to try to get out of their racism because according to CRT, the only thing more racist than white people is a white person trying to display how not racist they are because then they're just trying to get rid of their racist moniker. So according to CRT, if you're white, you're racist, and if you try to not be racist, that just proves how racist you are. Uh, it seems to me to be a uh, heads-I-win, tails-you-lose scenario. 
Uh, and more than just the idea that white people are racist, it goes even further and it says that things that are specifically, um, things that superficially appeared to fight against racism were actually just allowed by white people to further their own cause. That white people only allow black people in the US to have more rights and freedoms and privileges as it just helps white people to maintain their current status. This is the idea of interest convergence. Uh, you know, when the interests, the interests of white people and the interests of black people converge, then white people will allow black people to have their interests. But other than that, they won't. That is the idea of interest convergence. And uh, James Lindsay and Helen Pluckrose, they say it this way. They say that interest convergence holds that whites have allowed rights to blacks only when it was in their interest to do so. A dismal view that denies the possibility that any moral progress had been made since the Jim Crow era. This is no exaggeration of his intent. Derrick Bell states this explicitly in his 1987 book, And We Are Not Saved, The Elusive Quest for Racial Justice. So now I am quoting from Bell. Progress in American race relations is largely a mirage, obscuring the fact that whites continue, consciously or unconsciously, to do all in their power to ensure their dominion and maintain their con control. So ideas like CRT and these ways basically show that one's ethnicity is the most important thing about that person. It goes against what Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said when he gave his vision that one day people will be judged by the content of their character and not by the color of their skin. Critical race theory must inherently go against this dream of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. CRT destroys individuality and makes everyone the byproduct of their social conditions, beginning with their skin color. Shelby Steele, he writes about this idea in his book, White Guilt, when he says, white racism had made my race the limit of my individuality. But now the black consciousness I was learning from people like Gregory wanted me to voluntarily, even proudly, do the same thing that racism had done, make my race more important than my individuality. So the reason that CRT wants everyone judged by the color of their skin, and they specifically want this because white guilt transfers into black power, as in another section of his book, Shelby Steele writes that this is why white guilt is quite literally the same thing as black power. When white people feel guilty, they give things to black people, and that's how black power and white guilt are the same thing, which is the main premise of that book I quoted from by Shelby Steele. So this is critical race theory and all of its divisive glory. White people and other oppressors, white people are oppressors and black people and all other minorities are the oppressed and the oppressors need to rise up in revolution against their oppressors. This power struggle, all of these power struggles are all for the sake of les revolutions so that those who were oppressors can now be oppressed to make all things even more, uh, to make, sorry, you know, this is all for the sake of the revolution, so that those who were oppressors can now be oppressed to make all things even, because with critical race theory, two wrongs do make a right. They have to make everything even. If certain people groups were oppressed in the past, they need to oppress those other people back to make everything even, because forget what you were told in elementary school, two wrongs do make a right. But intersectionality is also important in this discussion of CRT, and it's similar in many ways. Intersectionality is a term that Kimberly Crenshaw came up with in the late 80s. So she was a black feminist, and she came up with the term intersectionality when working on her ideas of black feminism. And here's basically the premise behind how it started. The civil rights movement did a lot to help black people but it really didn't do a whole lot to help black women because they are not just black, but they are black women. But then likewise, the feminist movement, it didn't do a whole lot to help black women because black women aren't just women, they are black women. So she came up with intersectionality because 
the civil rights movement, she says, mainly helped black men, and the feminist movement, she writes, mainly helped white women, but black women are not black men, nor are they white women. They are black women, so therefore they have the intersection, they have the intersection of being both female and being black. So they are oppressed in a double way. A black man is oppressed in one way, a white woman is oppressed in another way, but a black woman is oppressed in both of those ways, according to Kimberly Crenshaw and intersectionality. So that is how the idea of intersectionality was born. The various oppressed statuses you hold are like intersections with one another. Some, some people have more than other. If you are a straight, white, cisgender Christian male, you have negative 9,000 intersectional points. You are awarded nothing, and may the gods of intersectionality have mercy on your soul. But every, inter every intersection of oppressed status that you hold is another intersectional point. So, <clears throat> um, what, why are these things I'm referring to as intersectional points important? They are important because of standpoint theory, that thing I referred to a little bit ago and said we would come back to. Standpoint theory, also known as standpoint epistemology because it is a theory of knowledge. Standpoint theory is important, and this is how Encyclopedia Britannica describes it. It says that standpoint theory is a feminist theoretical perspective that argues that knowledge stems from social position. The perspective denies that traditional science is objective and suggests that research and theory have ignored and marginalized women and feminist ways of thinking. This theory emerged from the Marxist argument that people from an oppressed class have special access to knowledge that is not available to people from a privileged class. <coughs> That last sentence in the definition captures much of the theme of standpoint theory or standpoint epistemology and intersectionality. Being from an oppressed class gives one a certain knowledge that those who are not oppressed in the same way do not have. And with that knowledge comes power in the revolution. Those who were oppressed before have power now because viva la revolution. So think of it with this helpful analogy that James Lindsay came up with. If you watched the Trojan Horse YouTube videos a couple years ago from Sovereign Nations, then you may remember this analogy James Lindsay gave. <clears throat> he basically explains intersectionality with the idea of uh, seeing in various colors. If you are a straight white male, then you can only see in grayscale. But if you are a straight white female, then you can now see in one color. So, um, uh, just one moment. Uh, yeah, so if you are a heterosexual white cisgender male, you can only see in grayscale, but minorities, they all have different colors they can see in. The more minority status is the more colors you can see in because marginalized groups can see in colors that not marginalized groups cannot. So the heterosexual black cisgender male can also see in red. He can see in grayscale and he can see in red. But then the uh, homosexual black cisgender male can also see in green. He can see grayscale, red, and green. The homosexual black cisgender female can see red, green, and blue. Now she can see in all of the colors. But this list can go on indefinitely. The gender fluid black transgender female Muslim would be like a tetrachromat, one who can see in a fourth primary color. Uh, all of this here I was just quoting from were actually more or less direct quotes from my article, Christ Intersectionality and Christianity, which you can find at the website for Cruciform Ministries. So Jose Medina, he refers to this analogy as kaleidoscope conscience. And he also calls it meta-lucidity, those terms coming from his books the epistemology of resistance, gender and racial oppression, epistemic injustice, and resistant immigration, imaginations. Uh, I have called them the color wheel of victimhood. That is the term I have given to this idea James Lindsay was describing. And the color wheel of victimhood is also the title of a book that 
I will be writing soon that will be coming out later this year or next year. So here are several quotes from Lindsay and Pluckrose to help us better understand intersectionality. They say, in this new feminist paradigm, knowledge is situated, which means that it comes from one's standpoint in society, by which they means one membership in intersection, intersecting identity groups. This, in turn, renders objective truth unobtainable and ties knowledge to power and both knowledge and power to discourses that are believed to create, maintain, and legitimize dominance and oppression within society. Standpoint theory operates on two assumptions. One is that people occupying the same social position, that is identities, race, gender, sex, sexuality, ability, status, and so on, will have the same experiences of dominance and oppression and will, assuming they understand their own experiences correctly, interpret them in the same ways. From this follows the assumption that these experiences will provide them with a more authoritative and fuller picture. The other is that one's relative position within a social power dynamic dictates what one can and cannot know. Thus, the privileged are blinded by their privilege and the oppressed possess a kind of double sight and that they understand both the dominant position and the experience of being oppressed by it. Uh, this is where you get the idea that black people that don't vote straight Democrat and don't go along the party line and believe what all the other black people believe are betraying their race because these people actually have the racist assumption that all black people should think the same way. And if a black person doesn't think the same way, it's the problem with him, not the assumption that all black people should think the same way. Uh, and then lastly, roughly the idea is that members of dominant groups experience a world organized by and for dominant groups while members of oppressed groups experience the world as members of oppressed groups in a world organized by and for dominant groups. Thus, members of oppressed groups understand the dominant perspective and the perspective of those who are oppressed, while members of the dominant groups only understand the dominant perspective. Basically, the idea is that intersectionality, to once again quote, gives the oppressed a richer, more accurate view of reality. Hence, we should listen to it and believe their accounts of it. So as you can see, CRT and intersectionality, contrary to popular propaganda, do nothing to help develop unity between the various ethnicities and social classes and all of those things. But rather, they only seek to be divisive and to tear apart the various ethnicities and social classes and economic classes and things like that. It does this because you need oppressor versus oppressed narratives to have the revolution, and you can't have these oppressor versus oppressed narratives if everyone is united together. Only the gospel can truly unite, not some Marxist and applied postmodernist theory that seeks to point out some sort of unknown racism in every white person. Blessed be the ties that bind our hearts in Christian love, the fellowship of which is like to that above. Cursed be the binds that divide our hearts in critical theory hatred. The animosity of divided minds is like to that below. So that hymn and anti-hymn lead us well into what I want to address next, which is how these ideas of CRT and intersectionality have made their way into the church in America. What is perhaps the most well-known example of CRT and intersectionality making their way into the church is through Revolution 9, not Revolution 9, Resolution 9 from the SBC's 2019 annual conference. While I do not want to read the entire resolution here, I will read certain portions of it. Whereas concerns have been raised by some evangelicals over the use of frameworks such as critical race theory and intersectionality, and whereas critical race theory is a set of analytical tools that help explain how race has and continues to function in society, and intersectionality is the study of how different personal characteristics overlap and inform one's experience. And whereas 
critical race theory and intersectionality have been appropriated by individuals with worldviews that are contrary to the Christian faith, resulting in ideologies and methods that contradict scripture, and whereas evangelical scholars who affirm the authority and sufficiency of scripture have employed selective insights from critical race theory and intersectionality to understand multifaceted social dynamics, resolved that critical race theory and intersectionality should only be employed as analytical tools subordinate to scripture, not as transcendent ideological frameworks, and be it further resolved that Southern Baptists will carefully analyze how the information gleaned from these tools are employed to address social dynamics, and be it further resolved that Southern Baptist churches and institutions repudiate the misuse of insights gained from critical race theory, intersectionality, and any unbiblical ideologies that can emerge from their use when uh, absolutized as a worldview. So the SBC, the largest conservative denomination in the United States, said that CRT and intersectionality are analytical tools that can be employed as long as they are subordinate to scripture. Now, you may be thinking that this is fine because as long as they are kept subordinate to scripture, then anytime they contradict scripture, they will be stopped because they need to be kept subordinate to scripture and not become transcendent frameworks. Uh, so as lovingly as I possibly can, I want to say that friend, beloved, you need to study more history of how various organizations and denominations in the last century or two have made the slide from conservative to liberal. You are not New St. Andrews College one day and Union Seminary trying to apologize to plants for your environmental sins the next day. That doesn't happen overnight. That happens over a period of time. It starts off with little things where you're conservative in one area and you switch to being conservative in another area which really means you're not quite as conservative as before, but you're still pretty conservative. And that happens through things like this. When you bring in destructive heresies and you say, as long as they're kept subordinate to scripture, they're all right. Well, sure, as long as they're kept subordinate to scripture, they're all right, but how can you have a destructive heresy be subordinate to scripture? The only way it can be kept subordinate to scripture is to throw it out entirely. There, are, there is no meat on those bones. And with that then, when you try to make these antithetical to scripture frameworks be kept as analytical tools as long as they're kept below scripture, you just end up seeing ways here or there popping up where they supersede scripture in one way or another. Now the people doing it won't say that they're allowing it to supersede scripture, but in practice that is what they are doing. They are allowing it to supersede scripture in that they are interpreting scripture in light of CRT and intersectionality not interpreting CRT and intersectionality in light of scripture. And by doing that, they are able to say that they are keeping it subordinate to scripture and just using it as an analytical tool kept below scripture when in fact it is becoming more important than scripture. So I wanna ask, how can something that is completely contradictory to scripture and based upon atheistic, Marxist, and applied postmodern ideas be a helpful analytical tool that alongside but still below scripture is able to help us to better understand things in culture. Is Shintoism a helpful analytical tool? Is Islam a helpful analytical tool? Is the Enneagram a helpful analytical tool? Is the Ouija board a helpful analytical tool? The answer to all of those questions should be no, just as the answer should be no to CRT and intersectionality. But the adoption of Resolution 9 is not the only way we see the woke movement being brought into the church in the United States. We see it in liberation theology being taught in conservative institutions such as Southern Baptist seminaries. Liberation theology is a destructive heresy that will damn any person who believes in it because it contradicts the gospel. It replaces it with a new gospel. Yet people are teaching in conservative seminaries they are not using James Cone's name. He is the father of black liberation theology, but they are teaching liberation theology, teaching what James Cone taught without using his name because they know to use his name would do 
rightly bringing all kinds of backlash against them. And this is happening in SBC seminaries. I'm actually recording this in an SBC church, so it is uh, quite interesting. <laughs> uh, we see the woke movement growing in other ways as well. We see the woke movement growing in the American church through false teachers like Kyle James Howard, Jamar Tisby, and Thabiti Anyabwile, who have large platforms and use those platforms to teach these godless ideologies. We see the woke movement growing when we hear that all, all white churches should try to be more inclusive by having minorities in their membership, and if they aren't, then they're sinning. But having an all-black church is perfectly fine. We see the woke movement growing when we hear that if a white person is choosing a new church to adjoin, he's got a few on the list, he's trying to decide, you know, narrow down those three or four down to one. If one of those three or four churches he's trying to decide between is a predominantly black church, if he doesn't choose that one, the reason he didn't choose it is because of racism. You know, it can't be just that that one and this other church are both really good, but the reason he decides the not all black church is that one was singing Hillsong and he doesn't want any part of Hillsong, so he goes the other one, or maybe the preacher is a little bit better of an expositor or anything like that. No, it has to be he didn't choose the black church because he's racist. That's an example of the woke movement coming into our culture, our Christian culture in America. We see the woke movement growing and how white people are referred to by their skin color. Uh, actually, not just white people in general, how people, all people of all skin colors are referred to by their skin color rather than just as a brother or sister in Christ. Uh, a decade or two ago, I don't think you heard nearly as often someone being called a black man or a black woman or a white man or a white woman or an Asian man or an Asian woman. It was just, that's my brother in Christ. That's my sister in Christ. Um, oh, and by the way, when someone says people like you, not just their way of calling you by your skin color without actually calling you by their skin color, by your skin color, so they can pretend they're not being racist and saying it. I've had a, a very woke black man refer to me as people like you, which meant white people, but you know, he wasn't actually saying white people, so it wasn't racist or something like that. I don't know. Um, we see the woke movement growing in tokenism saying things like, you'd take a black seven over an Anglo eight, but you wouldn't take a black six over an Anglo eight, because that's tokenism. Either way, that's still tokenism. We see the woke movement growing and changing views of power dynamics in the church. For example, take the recent situation with Cy Ten Bruggenkate. I don't know the specific details, and I don't need to know them, because if you're not part of the solution or part of the problem, it is gossip. But this is what I do know. It appears that Sai had some sort of moral failing with a woman. And uh, even if I am wrong by the situation, this is still seen in other scenarios. But because he is a man and she is a woman and therefore he has more power than her, because things are interpreted in light of power struggles, he is the one at fault, not her. She is the innocent victim of him. And it doesn't matter that they were both willing participants. He's the oppressor, and she's the innocent victim, the oppressed. Now, from a covenantal patriarchal perspective, we should put more onus on the man as he is the head. He is the one in authority and bears responsibility for the family. However, that is completely different from this power dynamic idea, how the one with more power, typically the straight white male, is the one that is always at fault because he has the least intersectional points. We see the woke movement growing in the church because, or in light of the double speak that we see with organizations like the Gospel Coalition or Dr. Albert Moeller from Southern Seminary. When the Gospel Coalition continuously puts out articles that low key support critical race theory or intersectionality, but then every once in a while throw out some Neil Shenvey article, never an A.D. Robles or a John Harris article, because those people are actually willing to call them out by name. Always someone who plays a little bit nicer, like Neil Shenvey, not to, not to uh, try to trash on Neil Shenvey. He does do helpful work, but he's nicer than some of the other guys, and that's why Gospel Coalition will post his articles occasionally. That way, when you, con when you point out how they are promoting these ideas, they can always say, no, look, we posted that Neo Shenvi article just the other month, so therefore we're not woke. That's how it works. And we also see it with Al Mohler when 
He does nothing to stop things like Resolution 9 or critical race theory getting taught in the SBC when he sees it. But yet, three days after Resolution 9 gets passed, he goes on the briefing and gives this wonderful explanation of CRT and intersectionality and how they're terrible. But yet, he will not actually put that great explanation into effect in his own seminary, despite the fact that he's basically the most powerful person in the SBC and he could stop this, or at least try to stop it if he was willing to. That is an example of speaking out of both sides of one's mouth. That is being double-minded. We see the woke movement growing in the church when pastors such as David Platt won't hold church because it is too dangerous and someone could get COVID, but they happily partake in Black Lives Matter marches. Apparently, obeying scripture to worship God is too dangerous when a virus with a 99.7% survival rate is going around, but it's not too dangerous when that virus is going around to go partake in marches to support a Marxist organization that wants to deconstruct society and tear down things like the nuclear family. And I'm not just calling BLM Marxists to make fun of them. The founders of BLM said that they are trained Marxists. We see the woke movement growing in instances like that Tom Samuel Say was told he was betraying his race when he asked, um, he was betraying his race. In response, Samuel Say said, how am I betraying Christianity? You see, the hidden assumption in that question was that his skin color, because Samuel Say is a black man, is more important than his Christianity. But then again, that's just another example of how liberation theology is getting into Christian culture today. Because James Cone readily admitted that being black was more important than being a Christian to him. Uh, and that just goes further to show what I say, that critical race theory and intersectionality in the church today is just the new form of liberation theology. We see the woke movement growing in all these ways and others. And all areas where the woke movement is growing, the division is growing. It is not unifying, it is dividing. Now, the woke mob will try to gaslight us and tell us how we're the ones causing the division, not them. But don't listen to their lies. They are the ones causing division in the church and trying to gaslight us by telling us it is our fault. Don't allow them to prostitute the bride of Christ for 30 shekels in a shirt. But we don't just see the woke movement growing and, and its growth seeking to harm the bride of Christ from attacks within the church. We see it from attacks outside the church onto the church, attacks from the culture onto the church because of CRT. An example of this is this one time about a year ago, my friend Noah preached a sermon on Black Lives Matter and CRT and how destructive these things are, and they put the sermon on YouTube. Uh, not to mention how just thinking about the comments on that YouTube video make me angry. Not just to think about that, but his church was actually vandalized because of that sermon and putting it on YouTube. They had several windows in the church broken a couple days after that sermon was posted to YouTube. We see attacks from outside coming on the bride of Christ every time the church is called racist for not going along with the woke mob. We see attacks from outside coming on the church and examples like this. To once again use my friend Noah as an example. He grew up for much of his childhood in Japan because his, missionary, his parents are missionaries to Japan. Actually, uh, Noah and I first became friends talking about anime and manga and stuff like that because he lived in Japan for a while. And even though I've never been to Japan, sometimes I act like I'm Japanese on the inside. So Noah, he was actually, I think this was in the comment section of that same YouTube video I just mentioned. Someone was telling him how he's never been oppressed. He doesn't know what it's like because he's white. And he responded, I actually grew up in Japan. So they're saying, you know, you've never been in a, mi a minority. You don't know what it's like. He says, actually, I grew up in Japan where I was a minority. You know what the response was? He was told, well, if you were black in Japan, it would have been worse. So the fact that you were white in a minority doesn't matter because if you were black in a minority, it, it would have been worse. So they won't let you win. Like I said, it's heads I win, tails you lose with them. Uh, so basically with that, it's, if you are white, you're an oppressor, no matter what, to them. We see attacks from outside coming on the church when Pastor Tom Buck tweets out that an Israelite living in the 10 northern tribes 
when Ahab was king, would never tell his daughter, look at Jezebel and make her an example to yourself of what it's like for a woman to be in power. And this is a true statement, but instead people attacked him for being racist because, you know, every once in a while in rare situations that almost no one hears about anymore, Jezebel can be a term to refer to a sexually loose black woman and Kamala Harris is half black. So therefore his statement's racist, even though most people in the country prior to this situation had never heard of Jezebel being used in such a way. Oh, and this is actually an example of a text from outside and inside the church because people within the church were saying that he's terrible, that his church needs to be removed from the SBC. Never mind the SBC hardly removes a church for teaching straight up heresy, but they wanted to remove him for this. Um, we see attacks coming from outside inside, into the church when we see a goat who was pretending to be a sheep shoot up several massage parlors, and because they were more Asian massage parlors, the majority of the women killed were Asian, and we're getting told how it's white supremacy that he killed them because he targeted Asian people because he's just this white supremacist, and it's because he learned white supremacy from the SBC church he was a part of. And then this is actually an example of attacks from without and within the church as well, because people within the church were saying, see, it's Founders Ministry's fault, because his church was a Founders-friendly church. So if someone pretending to be a Christian who's not does something sinful, it's Founders Ministry's fault, because he had attended a church that was Founders-friendly. So these ideas impact not just the second sphere of authority, which is the church, the family, the church, and the state are the three spheres of authority. They also impact the third sphere of authority, which is the government. We see this in several ways. One can clearly be seen in laws that have been passed over the course of the last several years. And, you know, over the last several years, certain laws that have been passed that promote ideas of CRT and intersectionality. Uh, one we're going to look at first is actually a law that's been in effect for a while before intersectionality even had a name for itself. The idea of affirmative action. This is an example of concepts such as CRT and intersectionality impacting a nation at the governmental level. Basically, affirmative action, accomplish, what it accomplishes is that it allows black people to be allowed into colleges, universities, and other institutions where normally their GPA or their test results or things like that would keep them from going in to more or less get certain quotas of quote unquote minority students. The idea is that the person, when at a college above where they really should have been able to go, will uh, try to rise up to the standard, to rise up to the challenge, and will therefore be better off because they will have pushed themselves harder to do well at that college or university, and then will have a more prestigious diploma when they graduate. And I understand the thought process behind it, but it actually in practice is a terrible idea with terrible consequences for black people, actually, and then for the culture at large. So let's use myself and his example first and then explain how it applies to affirmative action. The reason I'm using myself and his example first is to at least not give them too much bait to accuse me of being racist. Uh, so if I, you know, I went to a decent college, I was in high school and in college pretty much at the top of my class the entire time. Like overall, people would say I'm a pretty smart person. But if I went to Harvard, I would have probably been at the bottom of my class and probably dropped out before I graduated because I can try to rise up to the challenge of a college that's a little bit above my level, but I have a certain level. I can't rise up any higher beyond that. You can work harder, but at the end of the day, you can only get your intelligence so high by working harder. Some people are naturally more intelligent than others, and gaps can be made up for by working hard, but working hard can't make you have a higher natural intelligence than you actually do. So, you know, I could, like I said, I could have gone to a school that was a little bit more difficult than the one I went to and risen up to the challenge and been fine. That probably wouldn't have worked if I went to Harvard Law School. So take that and apply this to affirmative action. Yes, there are people that are helped by this because they go to a school a little bit above their capacity, but they are able to work hard and through discipline rise up to the challenge. But there's a certain point where it's beyond your capacity to rise up to the challenge of. And that is the problem with affirmative action. Some people are just placed too high above their capacity 
or when they are placed a little bit above their capacity, they don't rise up to the challenge. So basically what this happens is you get a black person who is very intelligent and at a good school would be at the top of his class, but because he was sent to an elite school, he's at the bottom of his class. And this does several things. One, it helps to reinforce stereotypes that black people are less intelligent than white people because the black people are at the bottom of their class. And that actually is a racist stereotype that needs to be destroyed, not the fake racism that CRT is always talking about. That actually is a racist stereotype that black people are not as smart as white people. But then mismatching black people to institutions above their capacity just helps to reinforce the stereotype. And then another thing, a lot of times, you know, it's discouraging to always be at the bottom of your class. So sometimes, maybe a lot of times, because of affirmative action, black people actually drop out before they graduate because they're sick of how difficult it is or always being at the bottom of their class or they just straight up can't handle it because they were mismatched to an institution above their capacity. And actually, it's been shown that affirmative action has lowered, uh, has lowered graduation rates in these elite institutions of black people because they're being mismatched to them. You know what's worse than having a diploma from a good college? Not having any diploma at all, just going to an elite college for two years and then dropping out. That elite college might be elite, but I'd rather have a diploma from a good college than drop out after a year or two from an elite college. It doesn't matter that you say, I went to Harvard for two years if you dropped out before you got any degree. It's more important to have a bachelor's degree from a not prestigious school than to have gone to a prestigious one for a year or two. So it is actually harming black people and then through that harming the society as a whole. Because when you harm one people group within a society, especially a people group that makes up 13% of the society, you harm the society as a whole. So uh, Shelby Steele, who I quoted a bit ago, he himself is actually a black man this is what he wrote on the idea of black people being tossed the bone of intersectionality to, or sorry, of affirmative action, to use his words. He says, worse, I had become terrified of the Faustian bargain waiting for me at the doorway to the left. We'll throw you a bone like affirmative action if you'll just let us reduce you to your race so we can take moral authority for helping you. When they called you a uh, term I'm not allowed to use, but I think it's all right for him to use. When they called you a that term back in the days of segregation, at least they didn't expect you to be grateful for it. So there he's basically saying that affirmative action is the same thing as calling someone the N-word. But at least when they called you the N-word 60 or 70 years ago, they didn't expect you to be thankful to them for doing it. So... Um, he much understands the idea of how things like affirmative action are actually harming black people, not helping them. Another way we see ideas such as CRT and intersectionality growing in our society at the governmental level is when President Trump, all too late and all too little, signs an executive order a month before the election banning the teaching of critical race theory in select government institutions, something he should have done in the first year of his presidency, not the last, but besides the point, he actually did it and then one of the first things President Biden does after going into office is to do, issue an executive order of his own, reversing that executive order. A third way we see ideas such as CRT and intersectionality growing in our society at the governmental level is how those in universities today will be the ones writing the laws of tomorrow. So what is an idea being promoted in universities today will be encoded into law in the future. And then one last way, though this list is not exhaustive, I was just giving you four examples. One last way that CRT and those ideas are growing in our culture at the governmental level is when we see companies that are adopting these ideas and will thus impact the entire nation. <clears throat> the general line of progression with these woke ideas appears to be the universities, then the culture, then the business, then the government. University culture, business, government. It starts by being taught in the university. Then from the university, the ideas get populated in the culture as people who went to those universities and were taught these ideas start becoming more and more you know, amounts of people in the culture, a bigger percentage of the population. Then eventually businesses promote these ideas. 
because the leaders of the business either support the ideas themselves, in which case business might be second instead of third, or the business sees these ideas growing in the culture and they want to jump on board to try to grow their market share or at the very least not decrease their market share. Lindsay and Pluckrose catch the latter motivation with businesses in this quote from their book. It is perhaps not surprising that large corporations have caved in so easily to social justice pressure. Their overriding goal is, after all, to make money, not to uphold liberal values. Since the majority of consumers and voters in Western countries support the general idea of social justice, this time having a little s and little j, the first time was a capital S and capital J, and there's an important distinction there. So since the majority of consumers and voters in Western countries support the general ideas of social justice, and since most people fail to understand the difference between social justice, lowercase, and social justice, uppercase, large corporations sometimes find that it is an astute public relations to give in, at least on minor matters that do not much affect the bottom line, to the demands of social justice activists. So then, once the ideas of CRT and intersectionality have influenced the universities, the culture, and businesses, it is only a matter of time until they influence the government as well, becoming encoded into law. And since these ideas are very discriminatory toward those it feels are oppressors, this is very bad for certain people, such as Christians, who actually believe what the Bible says when it comes to things like homosexuality or the differences between men and women or biblical reconciliation and things like that. So one interesting turn of events when putting these ideas into practice is how the government gets around things that would break federal law or the Constitution. If doing something to promote these ideas, CRT, intersectionality, and all that stuff, all the woke movement would break laws like the First Amendment, the government can uh, cause private businesses to do the dirty work for them, like censorship on social media platforms. And then when the private businesses are the ones doing the censorship, then you can't say anything is being done wrong because it's just the free market. If you, as a biblical Christian should, loves the free market since God's the one who came up with the idea of the free market, then you can't say anything about private businesses censoring because it's their right to do so. And then when those private businesses actually do violate laws in their censorship, then the government just kind of gives them a wink and a nod as it looks the other way and doesn't do anything because the government can't do that censorship themselves since it would break the First Amendment. So when the private business does it and actually breaks the law by doing it, such as breaking discrimination laws, the government just looks the other way since they're allowing the business to do their dirty work for them. So now that we have looked at what CRT and intersectionality are and how these ideas have crept into both church and state, let's look at what we can do to fight against these dangerous ideas. First, I think we should look to scripture. Let's bring up those passages I mentioned a bit ago. The first one was Exodus 23, 2 and 3. You shall not follow the masses in doing evil, nor shall you testify any dispute so as to turn aside after a multitude in order to pervert justice, nor shall you be partial to a poor man in his dispute. The Exodus passage, this first one, teaches us that we should not follow the masses in doing evil. So on the day of judgment, looking at God and saying everyone else was doing it is not going to be a sufficient excuse. It, then the verse, it restates that same idea, but this time giving a more specific example. It uh, you know, it gives an example of what following the masses and doing wicked looks like. It says that you should not follow the masses in order to pervert justice by bearing false testimony in a dispute. Finally, the verse says that you should not be partial to a poor man in his dispute. And by dispute, think Israel's version of our modern day arbitration or court proceedings. So this verse is a death blow to CRT and intersectionality, but Many of them try to actually twist what the verse is saying here and use it to promote their ideas instead of how it actually contradicts them in context. 
the woke people in the church like to twist every verse that has the word justice in it, and they insert their ideas of justice that comes from Marxism and applied postmodern, postmodernism rather than from the Bible into whenever the Bible says the word justice. So let's look at the first part of that verse. You shall not follow the masses in doing evil. Well, since CRT and intersectionality are evil and are popular and ever-growing in popularity in our culture, I think that believing in those ideas and promoting those ideas is the very definition of what it looks like to disobey the command to not follow the masses in doing evil. Then the next line, nor shall you testify in a dispute so as to turn aside after a multitude in order to pervert justice. CRT and intersectionality are false justice ideas. They are actually injustice trying to claim that they are the true forms of justice. By promoting these ideas in the public square, Christians are turning aside after the multitude in order to pervert justice. When they promote such ideas as systemic racism and inherent bigotry in the heart of every white person, they are turning aside after the multitude in order to pervert justice. When these things turn into dispute situations, then they are bearing false witness. They are giving a false testimony in order to pervert justice because they are following after a multitude to do evil. And then lastly, in the second verse, nor shall you be partial to a poor man in his dispute. They think they have us here. They say that black people in America are the oppressed and therefore are an example of the poor man this verse is referring to. And... Uh, Therefore, we are being partial to him when we do not believe in things like inherent bigotry in the heart of every white person or in systemic racism, things like that. But in fact, they are the ones showing partiality. You see, partiality can be wrongly showing preference to someone or it can be wrongly showing contempt for that person. Either one is partiality. If I am a judge and I rule in favor of a rich person when he was obviously in the wrong because I'm hoping he will... Uh, give me a nice thank you that is more than just verbal later that might involve uh, you know, passing some bills into my hand. If I'm doing that, I am showing partiality and I am a wicked judge. But likewise, if I am a judge and I'm settling a dispute and there's a poor man who is obviously in the wrong, but I rule in his favor because I feel bad for him because he's poor, that also is showing partiality. So both of these things are wrong. Both are showing partiality, but the uh, woke person is trying to tell us that we are showing partiality when we are actually the ones being impartial. They're telling us that impartiality is just believing whatever the person who quote, who quote unquote is oppressed is telling us is true. This is how they are showing their empathetic white knightism. Whatever the oppressed person says is true, and if you don't believe them, then you're showing partiality because you're not believing them. And that way, they are twisting definitions. They are calling good evil and evil good. They are calling up, down, and down, up because they are saying that showing favoritism towards the poor is actually being impartial and doing fair justice, listening to both sides like the Proverbs tells us to do. One man sounds right until you hear the other side, the Proverbs say doing that is actually showing partiality to them because they have distorted the claims so that what is partial is impartial and what is impartial is partial according to them. So we see here, like I said, that they are claiming we are being partial when we are in fact being the impartial ones. If a person is being oppressed, we as believers should try to help him. They are right in doing that, but we shouldn't help this poor oppressed person by just listening to whatever they say and ignoring the other side. We should first see if they really are poor and oppressed or if they are lying. And then if they are truly being poor and oppressed, we should seek to make sure they receive right judgment in a court of law for it. And the person who was afflicting them, if that person broke the law, receives the proper punishment. And then we should do what we can to help this poor oppressed person. That doesn't mean trying to promote new ideas of welfare in the government. It actually means helping out of our own pocket that person. The government is the minister of the sword. The church is the minister of grace. So it should be the first and second spheres of authority, the family and the church helping the poor and oppressed, not the government. The government should judge 
the person who did the oppressing if they broke the law because the government does not bear the sword in vain, but the government is not the minister of grace to help the poor by stealing money from us via taxes, taking a good chunk off for themselves, and throwing the scraps at poor people when they're done. The church should be the one willingly and to the glory of God helping poor people from the volitional offerings that the members gave to that church to do that very work. Then on to the second verse, Leviticus 19.15. It reads, You shall do no injustice in judgment. You shall not be partial to the poor nor defer to the great, but you are to judge your neighbor fairly. So this verse serves to emphasize the point I was just making with Exodus 23, sorry, 22, 2 and 3. We must do no injustice in judgment, and an example of injustice in judgment is giving preferential treatment to the rich because he is rich, or giving preferential treatment to the poor because he's poor. We are to judge our neighbor fairly. So how do we fight against the ideas of critical theory in all of its forms? Critical race theory, queer theory, post-colonial theory, all of that. How do we fight against it in all of its forms? The answer is surprisingly simple, yet difficult to carry out. Preach the gospel to the unconverted. Disciple the converted. By those two things, you are fulfilling the Great Commission. Preach to the unconverted, dis disciple the converted. Study scripture, pray, educate others about these ideas and how they are godless and antithetical to scripture. And lastly, and perhaps this is the most important one, husband, love your wife, wife, submit to your husband. Then the two of you together have children, preach the gospel to your children, practice family worship, raise your children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord, and know that with the current birth rate in America, which is below the replacement level, if Christians are just faithful to obey scripture and having children and raising them in the discipline and instruction of the Lord, we will win the culture war in a, a generation or two. So in closing, I want to say we are longing for the day when justice rolls down like waters, but we know that day will only come as we preach the gospel disciple the nations, and pray that Christ conforms his bride into his image. It does not come by pushing godless ideologies into the church and calling them biblical justice, even though they are anything but that. Thank you, and have a great day.